Hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Park Budo. Yeah, good morning, Kate. Good morning. <laughs> Kate, you in US? Uh, yes, the IPA team is all in uh, the United States today. <laughs> okay. So right now it's uh, nine o'clock in the afternoon. In the uh, evening. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock ready. And yep. what, what city? What city in the US do you especially? We are in um, New, we are all over. So we're in New York, Washington, DC, North Carolina, and San Diego. So oh, okay. we span the whole country tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah. And you're uh, in mm -hmm. Yes, Kate. Uh, you're in Jakarta tonight? Yeah. Is this, uh, this morning? This morning in Jakarta, right now it's uh, nine o'clock. I hope it's not a uh, late night there for this workshop. <laughs> That's okay. We're well caffeinated. We're we're excited to talk. Uh, okay. And excited to share everything with you. So I think it'll be um, it'll be good timing between uh, our evening and um, and your morning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Great. So I think we actually have um, we have a lot of, of people uh, joining. So uh, Tanvi, should we get started? Yeah, we can get started. Hi, everyone. We're pleased to have you here for our workshop, Delivering Last Mile Services, a focus on women entrepreneurs. If you can take a look at the screen that we've just shared, it has a few um, technical things that we can have you do if, you're, if, you, if you'd like to. Um, so my name is, oh, we're still waiting on someone. Um, okay, that's fine. I'll just go through some of the housekeeping rules before. Um, so my name is Tanvi Jaluka. I'm a program manager with the financial inclusion team at Innovations for Poverty Action. You'll hear a little bit more about what IPA does when the presentations begin, um, but I'll be the host for today's event. Um, some other housekeeping rules is that if you'd like to hear the Bahasa translations, please use the translation features below. There's a globe that you can click on. Um, be sure to stay on the language channel you're most comfortable in. So if you'd like to speak and listen in English, please click on the English button. If you'd like to speak and listen in Bahasa, please click on that. Um, please click on the Japanese channel, actually. Um, I'd also like to remind you to please remain muted unless you've been called upon to speak but we do want this workshop to be interactive. So please feel free to use the chat feature at any time to ask or make questions um, or put any comments you'd like in either English or Bahasa. We'll also be providing the Bahasa translated presentation. You can see the tiny URL link on the shared screen and it will also be posted in the chat as well. Finally, we'll be recording tonight's event for internal use only. So if you don't want to be on the recording, please feel free to turn off your, your video. Um, along with me are my colleagues, Lauren, who is our program associate. She will be handling the technical logistics. So if you have any questions about Zoom or technology, please feel free to send her a private message. Then we have Elizabeth, who is a program manager with our small and medium enterprises team. She will be taking notes today. Um, so the agenda for today, um, we'll start off with some remarks from our, from our partners at OJK, Papanas, and MCC. Um, then my colleagues, Willie Blackman, Research Manager at IPA, and Kate Glenn Broderick, Associate Director at IPA, will present findings from an IPA survey of Indonesian entrepreneurs. The presentation will then be followed by Q&A, and then Dr. Russell Toth, Senior Lecturer, senior lecturer in, economic, in Economics at the University of Sydney will present some insights into the challenges and opportunities in providing financial services to women entrepreneurs. There'll be another opportunity for Q&A, and then we'll have some closing remarks by Rebecca Rouse, IPA's Financial Inclusion Director. Um, so I'd like to extend a thanks to our partners at Babanas, OJK, MCC, and CDT for all your help with this workshop and for all of the participants for attending. Um, and so perhaps we can begin our event with um, my colleague from OJK to make some brief introductions. Yeah. 
Uh, selamat pagi, uh, good morning Tanfi. Sorry Pak, Iwan Kurniawan Ariadi is here from Batanas. Okay, um, so then can we have the speaker from Bapanas um, give some comments? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ibu Tanfi. Uh, I'm so sorry I joined late because uh, suddenly this morning I got many telephone from minister uh, office yeah, preparing uh, his agenda. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry about that. But anyway, uh, very good morning, uh, Bapa Ibu and all participants of uh, this workshop. Welcome and thank you for your uh, participation, your attendance in this workshop. Uh, special good morning, uh, I address to Pak Widyo from uh, OJK. And uh, I, I, I think Ibu Nilufar from MCC is joining us uh, this morning. Also, Ibu Kate and our colleagues from Innovation for Poverty Action or IPA. As all of us are aware, uh, currently the government of Indonesia and the Millennium Challenge Corporation are preparing the second compact program for Indonesia. In this preparation stage, the government of Indonesia and MCC conducted a growth diagnostic in 2019. And this work came up with findings that underdeveloped financial intermediation is a binding constraint achieving growth. Based on this, the government proposed two programs. Namely, the first one is improving financial access for micro, small, and medium enterprises, or MSMEs particularly those owned by women. And the second uh, proposed program is infrastructure finance to improve connectivity. So far, uh, three provinces, North Sulawesi, South Sumatra, and Riau were selected for implementing these uh, programs. MSMEs are recognized as drivers for growth, employment generation, and poverty reduction. There are almost 64 million MSMEs in Indonesia that employ almost 67% of the labor force and account for over 61% of total GDP. Women own around 45% of MSMEs. However, in terms of uh, location or distribution, MM, MSMEs are highly concentrated in Java, around 75%, and approximately uh, 11% are located in Sumatra and 5% in Sulawesi. While in Sumatra and in Sulawesi, MMSE employ 83% and 87% of all, all workers respectively. So quite significantly absorb the work level force in, in those uh, two islands. Uh, our study also uh, reveals that limited access to finance transport and logistic services, national and international market buyers are major barriers reducing MSE potentials. According to reports, almost 90% of exporters are MSMEs, but their export contribution is only 13%. Women exporters did not find customs and trade regulations difficult and reported no losses due to theft, breakage, or spoilage. But without support, these women are not able to access international trade, which is limiting their growth. The government of Indonesia and MCC would like to support MSMEs in these selected provinces to unleash their potential and accelerating growth, job creation, and poverty reduction. We prepared seven uh, projects uh, that include development of alternative MSMEs credit risk assessment, and then uh, number two, development of supply chains finance platform. Number three, uh, supporting the development of FinTech data center and linking MMSE to FinTech. The fourth project is piloting innovative value chain or supply chains finance in targeted provinces. The fifth pro pro proposed project is development and expansion of innovative financing targeting growth-oriented women and own SMEs in targeted provinces. The sixth uh, proposed project is gender-responsive digital and financial literacy program. The seventh one is gender-responsive 
Investor Readiness Program for Transformational Small and Medium Enterprises and Startup, especially improving the access to international trade. The purpose of this workshop this morning is to discuss challenges and opportunities faced by women entrepreneurs in Indonesia business environment and to identify promising solution. This recently collected data provides valuable financial and behavioral insight of women micro, small, and medium entrepreneurs in under examined provinces. Last but not least, I'd like to thank Innovation for Poverty Action or IPA for conducting uh, the field work and survey of 500 women owned enterprise during this pandemic. It is very challenging work actually. And I hope uh, financial solutions identified in this workshop will help improving the design of MSMEs project and ultimately will help us in achieving the objective of the second compact program to improve access to finance of for uh, SMEs, especially uh, women-owned micro, small, and medium enterprises for increasing productivity and inclusive growth. Thank you for your attention, and we hope that all participants will engage in this fruitful discussion. I thank you. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to welcome our colleague from OJK to give some remarks. Thank you, Tanfi. Yeah. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everybody. Uh, especially for Pak uh, Kurniawan, uh, Mrs. Kate from uh, IPA and uh, our colleague also from uh, Papanas. Uh, so I, I uh, noticed in uh, participant is uh, uh, from AFTEC, AFP as well, the association, uh, association. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Firstly, I am uh, thank you, Pak Kurniawan uh, and Pak Penas, uh, for invite me in this uh, uh, this morning workshop. Uh, we are going to have a very important uh, discussion on this uh, workshop, uh, I believe. Uh, and uh, let me a little bit the background of uh, Indonesian uh, economy right now. Indonesia is one of the highest. Uh, unbanked population right now in the world. Among the 15, uh, 58 million SME, Indonesia is only 12% uh, have uh, entry to credit because to lack of uh, credit history, statement, and uh, collateral, of course. And this SME uh, uh, contribute uh, 60 uh, percent of the total GDP in Indonesia is very huge. Uh, <clears throat> financing gap is about uh, 166 billion uh, dollar. Yeah, it's really big uh, uh, gap. So this is the from the demand side. I think it's very big. Uh, how to address to improve this? Uh, uh, Poverty, I think. One of the root cause of the limited financing is a high perceived risk of uh, lending to MSME, especially women-owned MSME. On the supply side uh, of finance, information asymmetry makes it uh, difficult for lender to easily evaluate and uh, monitor MSI credit risk. Uh, the second compact uh, between uh, government of Indonesia M, uh, and MCC, supported by OJK, aim to strengthen the financial intermediation for MSME in Indonesia, especially uh, women-owned MSME. OJK and MCC uh, and CDT are excited about uh, the opportunity to support MSME in Indonesia, particularly those owned by women. This proposed uh, project being developed by a compact development team 
under the guidance of Papenas, of course, include the leveraging fintech for alternative credit assessment, improving financial market infrastructure, and uh, supporting innovative uh, uh, lending approach. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the demand side, if we uh, look at in this data, uh, women also uh, contribute to the recovery in finance based on the World Bank uh, data right now. 43% of for, uh, formal SME in Indonesia are women owned. This is youth. Of, of course, 66.7% of fintech, uh, we call it uh, SME borrower, are female entrepreneur. Women-owned SME is 52.9% uh, of the micro size, 50.6% uh, uh, of small size, and 34% of medium size. So this is a uh, really huge of uh, demands if we want to improve a uh, woman uh, economy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, OJK also uh, actively support in terms of uh, fintech development uh, right now, from the right now. I think in the last four years, uh, fintech peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending, currently uh, there's a uh, hundred and 31 fintech peer-to-peer -peer lending are already registered or licensed uh, are available. So, but uh, if, if we look at the uh, media, I think more than 3,000 already closed by government of Indonesia, a fintech, you know, illegal fintech. So this is uh, very interesting. Right now, also the 81 recorded digital financial innovation. Uh, this is under where right now uh, I am uh, in the team. Uh, from the 81 uh, recorded financial innovation is uh, divided into 15 cluster. There's the uh, aggregator, claim service handling, Innovative credit scoring, uh, property investment management, financial planner, this one fintech also, financing agent, funding agent, online distress solution, reg tech, insure hub, insure tech, uh, blockchain based, tech as an accounting. Know your customer, uh, uh, of, of course, uh, e know your customer. Uh, that this is uh, uh, right now. So there's a lot of uh, fintechs under OJK is uh, also developed uh, to uh, to improve the financial inclusion in Indonesia. Uh, OJK encourages collaboration between a financial service institution and provider of digital financial innovation and uh, create synergy to encourage the economy, of course, uh, right now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, right now, uh, our team also have uh, 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 research with uh, CCA from uh, USA, also, I think. So this is supported by uh, Bill and Melinda Kitt Foundation right now. And uh, the research is how to improve the financial agent, banking agent, uh, it uh, possibility to improve, uh, become to financial agent, uh, fi fintech agent also. And right now, uh, also this, uh, we we as a team also uh, to uh, to support how. Uh, Microcredit uh, institution in the rural area. Uh, I think this week also we already uh, this uh, conduct discussion about this. Uh, how to improve uh, in, in the rural area, economic in the rural area. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, I make it uh, short, uh, my remark. Uh, uh, really, I am uh, optimistic that development of innovation in the financial services industry will provide added value in improving financial access and financial independence of the community. Of course, including uh, uh, unbanked unbank uh, uh, community yeah. In the end, uh, it will be able to realize equitable development and enhance community welfare. The digital economy is the future of uh, economy. With that, I would then uh, my speed and wishing all of you a more vibrant discussion in this event. All efforts are dedicated to the development of knowledge for better people, profit, and planet, of course. Thank you, uh, Tanfi. Thank you so much. OK, and now I'd like to welcome Neela Fuhr from MCC to give some remarks. Uh, good morning, uh, Park Yuan uh, and Park Widodo. And the compact development team, friends from Indonesia, MCC, IPA, and workshop participants. I'm so glad we are finally able to organize this workshop. Though we all wanted to be in Jakarta with all, with all of you, uh, it is not possible during this pandemic time. But I'd like to thank IPA and CDT to really help IPA to gather all this data so we are able to get some primary information to help design the MSME program, which is so important as Park Iwan at Park, Park Wido just said. Uh, I will not uh, uh, talk a whole lot. I only wanted to say that uh, after the successful completion of the first uh, compact, uh, Indonesia and MCC again were very glad to work together again and, and develop uh, this compact that will benefit particularly the women in Indonesia. As you know, MCC has a gender policy and an investment criteria that is women's economic empowerment. So we need to ensure that whatever MCC is financing, we are promoting uh, women's economic empowerment in workforce participation and, uh, and entrepreneurship. Plus, we also want to see that everybody, women, men, have equal opportunities to participate in the project and also benefit from it. I'd like to thank again IPA for their work, particularly during this difficult time, and would really like to thank Ibu Rini Udastuti for helping uh, IPA in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so welcome once again to some of the folks that joined a little bit late. Um, I've also noticed a few other attendees in the chat, and so I'd like to just say good morning to Mr. Dading Amhad uh, Gunadi from Bapinas. Um, he works on MSME issues um, with, with the Bapinas team. Um, and I'd also like to extend a good morning to representatives from the Ministry of Cooperatives and MSMEs, and also the Ministry of Women's Empowerment. Um, okay. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first presenters, um, Willie Blackman and Caitlin Broderick from IPA. Hello and uh, welcome again. I'm um, so excited to speak with you today and to share what we've learned so far about women owned MSMEs in two provinces in Indonesia. Um, so Willie will be helping me with the slide presentation, um, and so we'll, we'll go to the next one. Um, so I want to tell you a bit about who we are as Innovations for Poverty Action. Uh, IPA is a research and, and policy nonprofit that discovers and promotes effective solutions to global poverty problems. IPA brings together researchers and decision makers to design, evaluate, and refine these solutions and their applications, ensuring that the evidence created is used to improve the lives of the world's poor. We've been doing this work for almost 20 years now. Uh, the next slide. 
Uh, so this brings me to the project that we're currently working on in Indonesia. Uh, the ultimate objective of the project is for us to partner with a financial service provider to co-create a financial service or product that meets the financial needs of women-owned enterprises. In order to achieve that goal, we first want to identify some of the barriers that these women-owned enterprises face in accessing finance, particularly in accessing credit. Uh, so we spoke with a variety of stakeholders and collected data on about five on 500 growth oriented women owned enterprises through a quantitative sur survey. Uh, so today we're going to share some of these findings with you. As part of the project, IPA conducted about 25 stakeholder interviews earlier this year. We've spoken to a variety of industry leaders uh, from government officials, NGOs, and direct service providers, uh, many of whom are, are actually on the call here today. Next slide. Um, and in general, we heard from you that Indonesia is a, is a very large, it's a very complicated financial marketplace. That's also a, a very exciting place to do business uh, these days. And to, um, uh, especially around FinTech products and new innovations. But we did hear about a few key challenges. So we've heard that stakeholders um, feel that many women-owned businesses are thought to have lower levels of digital and financial literacy and have less access to collateral uh, than their male counterparts. Uh, currently, we see a lot of new innovation uh, it's centered in Jakarta and other urban areas, but financial service providers have, have yet to expand to new markets in further provinces like North Sulawesi or South Sumatra. Uh, so there are some challenges that we've heard around issues with connectivity, with smaller, more scattered populations, um, and especially when you're talking to a whole new customer base that, you know, onboarding uh, can take a bit longer. And, and um, we do see that a lot of financial service providers, however, do provide loan products to women-owned enterprises, um, but a lot of those financial services uh, focus on micro firms and not necessarily growth-oriented firms. Uh, so we're happy today to share with you the findings from our survey, which focuses exclusively on women-owned, growth-oriented, micro, small, and medium firms in North Sulawesi and South Sumatra. So uh, the next slide, please. Uh, that brings us to our recently completed survey. Uh, the goal of the survey is to understand key challenges and constraints that women-owned enterprises face. Our goal is to focus on understanding the current use of financial products and services, uh, digital usage, digital, digital literacy, as well as demand for different types of financial services and products. Uh, so Willie's going to explain a bit about how we conducted this survey. Great, great. Thanks, thanks so much, uh, Kate. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to spend just a few minutes sort of talking about the, the mechanics of, of how we uh, put on this survey, and then I'll turn it back to, to Kate to talk about what we found and, and why it matters. Um, so starting off with the, the basics, um, we conducted a, a phone survey of 500 business owner, owners, as you've heard before. Um, and, and like others, we um, had to respond to the, the COVID pandemic. Um, we had plans to initially um, conduct face-to-face in-person surveys, but with these women, but um, you know, needed to pivot to something remote, and so phone surveys were, were you know, was the best option that we had. Um, and so we we just finished our work. Um, we conducted uh, our uh, surveys over a period of weeks between April and May, so just just really finished up a few weeks ago. And so this is very fresh um, data. One thing to to keep in mind as you're thinking about the results that we have um, to present here is because we needed to do a, a phone survey, um, we needed to get a list essentially of, of women, uh, you know, women business owners um, and their phone numbers. Um, and this is you know, not an, a, 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 a simple thing to do necessarily. Um, and so what we ended up doing is relying on the, the 2016 economic census, which has this information. Um, and so what this, what this means for us is that essentially our firms are likely to be a bit older than the typical firm because we are uh, not able to reach newer firms that have been established you know, after 2016. Um, and we're also excluding agricultural firms just because they're not included in the economic census that's done um, by the government of Indonesia. And then finally, we decided to oversample 
um, small and medium firms. So our sample includes um, micro, small and medium firms. Um, but as I think we all know, uh, micro firms really dominate. Um, in, in the economic census, they represent about 90% of all um, MSMEs um, in, in these two provinces that are owned by, by women. Um, and so we made the decision to um, you know, continue to focus on, on uh, micro firms. They represent about uh, three quarters of the uh, total sample in, in, in our survey. Um, but then we did um, oversample small and medium firms. And so they represent uh, together about, about 25% um, of all firms. The other thing that I want to, to talk about is our um, effort to focus on particularly growth oriented women owned firms. Um, you know, this is important to us um, because we know that, that you know, access to finance may be really the binding constraint um, for firms that are otherwise poised for growth, growth oriented. Um, and so this is of course a very difficult thing to do um, to try to understand which firms are going to be growth oriented and which are not. Um, so what we did, uh, you know, given this task, we, we decided to focus on, on three different characteristics of firms that may be predictive of, of growth orientation. And so I'm gonna talk about those each in turn, but, but they are geography, where um, these firms are, are located within the two provinces that we focused, which sectors they are working in, which business sectors, and then some individual characteristics of the, the owners of the firms. So I'll start with geography. Um, first off, you know, as, as has been said before, we focused on South Sumatra and North Sulawesi, and we um, nearly evenly uh, split uh, between the two provinces, 148 in one and, and 252. Um, and the other. Then within the two provinces, we uh, restricted our focus to what the government of Indonesia calls growth corridors, uh, which are typically um, urban municipalities uh, within each of these um, provinces. And, and we thought that this was appropriate um, because uh, the, the types of digital finance products that we are um, you know, particularly excited about um, tend to, to uh, blossom first in, in urban areas before expanding to, to more rural areas. So we thought, you know, focusing there would make sense. Um, we, uh, it looks like our images are not showing up here. Let me, Kate, are you not able to see any of these images? No, okay, give me one second here. I think I've got a backup. Sorry about this. So. Okay. There we go. See, you can see the images now. Excellent. Okay, great. And um, so, uh, yes, so, so we focused on first geography, second, the business sector that we were um, focused on. So uh, we, uh, we, we based our uh, sort of focus on growth oriented sectors or high growth potential industries, um, as defined by Dahlberg in a, in a um, piece of work that, that was um, done, done for, for um, MCC in 2020. And so these range from um, sectors, you know, in, in the agriculture space to manufacturing to, to services. Um, and these sectors span value chains. So for example, um, coffee, the, the coffee sector could um, include anything from the initial production of coffee um, to wholesale of coffee to, to even retail coffee shops. Um, and so what we did is we reserved uh, about 50% of our sample for these high growth uh, sectors and the other 50% for other sectors where we know individuals um, may still be growth oriented, even if they are not necessarily in one of these growth oriented um, sectors. So that I think leads me to um, the final uh, sort of characteristic that we looked at um, in trying to identify growth oriented firms. And that is individual characteristics of the, um, of the business owner. Um, and so, again, this is a difficult task uh, to try to identify what individual characteristics of a business owner predict the firm's growth. Um, and so there's a lot of different, you know, uh, work out there that tries to do this. But what one that stood out to us was what's called the, the Striver Index. Um, 
which was developed in Mexico by the, uh, the MasterCard Foundation. And this is really focused more on um, sort of attitudes and, and beliefs about that, that business owners have about their um, about their, the businesses that they run rather than sort of hard skills or, or training. So, you know, the, the, the questions that the Striper Index is based on include things like, you know, whether you feel that you control the destiny of your business or you're doing the business because it suits your personality and passion. Um, so based on the MasterCard definition, um, we considered someone that got four out of six of these questions, you know, quote unquote, correct. Um, to be a, a striver individual. Um, so that was our focus on um, individual characteristics on uh, business, business sectors and, and geography. So I will turn it back over to Kate. Great, uh, the next uh, slide. So the interesting thing about this data set is that it is focused on these growth oriented firms, which we think is, is really unique, um, especially in these provinces for women owned businesses. So who are these drivers? We see that the owner's average age is about 46 years old. Uh, there's a diverse set of ethnic groups and religious uh, backgrounds across the provinces. About three quarters are married and 50% have completed their senior high level education. Uh, next. And their firms, um, it's an experienced group of businesses. On average, they've been in business for about 12 years. About half of them have expanded the scope of their business since opening. Uh, and as women, as Willie mentioned, our survey is mainly comprised of, of micro sized firms, but we do see that almost half of all businesses are formally registered. Interestingly, about 85% of those uh, who are registered reported that the formalization process was, was easy or very easy. Next. Uh, we see that there are also a group, diverse group of businesses across many different sectors. Uh, so we see that the firms are mainly found in retail, food and beverage services, manufacturing and accommodation. Uh, the most common are telecommunications, uh, food processing, retail trade, cosmetics, and uh, coffee, as Willie had mentioned. Next. And I, I think, um, you know, one thing that um, I find really interesting is that when we asked about the women's motivation to start their business, we see that a lot tend to be internally driven and growth oriented. So 50% uh, said that they were motivated to start their business to, to make more money um, additionally to be their own boss or because it, it made them happy. Uh, and next. So we do see that women are financially active and sophisticated uh, in, their, in their business. Um, so about a quarter have used mobile money for business purposes, but only 17% have actually had, uh, either have currently or have had a transactional bank account. Uh, but three quarters are using savings accounts and almost half are using savings groups. And that's across all firms. Uh, next. Uh, so the challenges, next. Thanks. Um, so what challenges do these growth oriented women owned businesses face? We see that they're highly motivated and they're successfully growing and running their business on average for about 12 years, but they're still facing challenges, especially in accessing digital financial services and in accessing credit to meet their business needs. Uh, so there's room to increase the use of digital financial services for business purposes. Um, and we also see that women report a lot of challenges in applying for and accessing formal credit. Uh, they talk a lot about it being a time consuming and not easy process. Uh, next. The, uh, yep, so women are, are using their smartphones. Um, there, we see that there's a lot of activity um, on, on phone use in general. Um, three quarters of women have and use a smartphone. Uh, and of those, about three quarters are using the internet for personal purposes. However, only about a quarter of women reported, report using mobile money for personal or business purposes, and less than half are using e-commerce for personal uh, or business uh, purposes. We see that basically no firms are paying their employees in cash, and very few have or use a QR code in their business. Uh, next slide, yep. So there seems to be a growth opportunity for women to expand their phone use 
and apply some of the features and applications that they use personally uh, directly to their business. Uh, we see that uh, in the reported amount of mobile money uh, used for personal use, we're, uh, across all firms, 20 to 45% of women report using, um, uh, report using uh, these systems uh, personally, but that we can see fewer medium and small firms are actually using mobile money accounts for their business purposes. So there's an, an opportunity there to encourage expansion um, from that personal use to a, bus a business case. And next. So as we mentioned, we see this opportunity to expand uh, to regions outside of Jakarta or Java. Uh, women grow women-owned growth-oriented businesses are currently using their phones. Uh, they're using it uh, quite frequently, but they're not necessarily making that transition to, their, to meet their business needs. So expanding features or increasing awareness amongst uh, the micro, small, and medium enterprises about how these features can be used um, is key. Uh, in terms of credit, we see a preference for in formal credit across all firm sizes. Of those who think that we would need, um, that, so of those that think that they need collateral for a future loan, we see about a third of respondents own business assets solely in their own name. Another third have access to business assets in joint ownership. Uh, so they do have access to collateral, uh, but is it the right kind of collateral that they need in order to borrow? So uh, the next slide. To understand a little bit more about the challenges, we want to first look at women's current borrowing behavior. And when we asked about their reasons for borrowing, women report borrowing to expand their business for a specific opportunity. Uh, that's the most cited, uh, the most frequent reason cited. And next. We also see that women-owned businesses can be very deliberate and strategic about the loan amounts that they request. So many women request the amount uh, that they need for their business opportunity, while others request the amount based on what they can afford to pay back. So of those uh, who borrowed in the previous 12 months, they report that if they don't receive the loan amount that they request, most are actually reducing their spending to make up that difference. So we're seeing, we're not seeing a lot of over borrowing or over indebtedness. Uh, next. And when asked, for what reason would you prefer to borrow informally from friends or families, the friends or family members, the majority of respondents said that it was easier in terms of completing the paperwork and that informal credit was, was closer in, in proximity to them. So people, uh, it was just literally, they were next door, they were nearby in their neighborhood. We see little distinction between micro and small firms, um, which was surprising to me. Uh, and, I, and we see that small firms are actually reporting slightly higher rates of, of comfort, uh, just greater comfort with the informal process. Uh, next. And as we've mentioned previously, about two thirds of women business owners do have access to collateral, um, but it might not be in her name only or to, and it might not be the right kind of collateral that's required for a loan. So most women, uh, but we see more in the small and medium firms, they have access to movable assets. And those movable assets are typically in their own name, but many banks aren't taking uh, movable assets as a collateral uh, for collateral purposes. So while the majority of women, either through owning their own asset or through jo joint ownership with another person, have access to some form of household or business asset, they, they need a lot more additional paperwork and a lot more uh, approvals to actually receive that loan. Uh, next. And so interestingly, we see that even though women do apply for a business loan that's in her own name, um, and she's using an asset that registered is registered to her name only, 71% of respondents said that they would still need their, their husband's permission to take out that loan. Um, and uh, next. So what we see is that, uh, again, there are opportunities here for financial service providers uh, to engage more with women-owned firms when uh, they're trying to access credit. 
So this can include things like streamlining the paperwork process, including uh, easing some of the, the spousal requirements when they're not legally necessary. It could mean expanding some collateral eligibility uh, in a way that makes sense for, of course, both the, the women-owned businesses as well as for the financial service providers. And to, to think through ways of investigating, uh, you know, new loan approval processes or, or products that could directly fit into women's uh, business needs. Um, great. So um, in terms of, of meeting these, these challenges, uh, go to the next slide. We want to, you know, we've given you a very brief overview of, um, of the survey that we, um, that we just completed, uh, but we do want to open the floor now a bit to have some, uh, to receive some questions. We can, we can provide some um, uh, clarity to, to any questions that you might have, but we also want to leave you with some questions and some thoughts about um, what changes can be made to help make credit more accessible to growth-oriented women-owned businesses. And so since they're specifically asking for some, you know, very uh, concrete um, uh, objectives and ideas, uh, especially when applying for credit, what are some of the thoughts that people have about trying to reduce this burden? What, what can be done? I'd like to open the floor now to, to any kind of any discussion or any questions in the chat. You can please feel free to unmute yourself or if you would like to use the raise hand feature, um, I can call on you that way as well. It is under the reactions tab. Hi, Kate. This is one from Aspect. Uh, hi, Janvi. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, hello, thank you. Hello. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, Pa Iwan, uh, Pa Widyo, and also uh, Kate from IPA. I'm Sofan from Asos Indonesia, Asos Indonesia Fintech Associations, or AFTE. Uh, glad to meet you again, Kate. So I have a yes. question mm -hmm. on based on the um, um, statistics that you already presented. Uh, there is 60% um, of women uh, MSMEs prefer to access credit through informal institutions. And um, they prefer also to have less paperless, uh, paperless uh, process in order to get uh, an access for financing. I would like to know if um, you have any information if the those uh, women MSMEs using fintech, um, for instance, for peer to peer lending to get an access for financing, or perhaps other uh, fintech services, services for efficiency. Um, such as e-money, e-wallet, or other fintechs. It would be good to, to get to know the, uh, whether they, they already uh, exposed to the uh, services. Uh, thank you for the uh, for the question. So we asked, um, you know, unfortunately, we were a little bit uh, consolidated in the in the survey that we asked because it was a phone survey. And so we didn't get to ask as many of the fintech related questions as we had really uh, intended to. So we are are. are um, answers are a bit more constricted to e commerce in general and. Um, Financial service, provide, uh, financial service products specifically. So around insurance, bank accounts, um, savings accounts, savings groups. So we know a lot more about the specific types of, um, of financial products. Maybe, uh, Willie, if you're able to go back to, um, I think it's slide. Um, uh, 21. So we can see a bit more about how um, women-owned firms are, are using uh, different types of financial products. Um, but this is all the firms in, in general. Uh, I mean, all the firms in aggregate put together. Um, and in terms of preferences for, for informal loans, um, and e-commerce, we actually really didn't see a difference. So in the use of, of e-commerce and the way that people seem to interact with financial service, other types of financial service products, we actually saw quite a bit of uh, consistency. 
but I think we can, uh, you know, look a little bit uh, you, deeper. Sure, I think we can look a little bit deeper on some of the uh, e-commerce um, uh, activity that we that we did see, especially by firm size and sector and um, you know types of businesses that they're in. I think that could be uh, helpful and, and interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there is any full report that we can uh, see the. Um, use the benefits of uh, using e-commerce or other fintech that would be great. Are there other questions? Selamat pagi. Uh, saya akan bertanya dengan Mbak. Saya akan menyampaikan se pandangan kami dari bahasa Indonesia ya saya ibnu dari Bank BRI kantor wilayah Manado Bank BRI Regional Office Manado oke saya di sini sebagai kepala departemen SME untuk wilayah empat provinsi di Sulawesi yang saya lihat dari presentasi saya yang saya lihat dari presentasi ya kelihatannya uh, membahas betapa sulitnya apa namanya akses keuangan untuk perempuan gitu uh, dan dihubungkan dengan beberapa variabel yang lain menurut kami dari data yang kami memil kami miliki ya kalau kami itu tidak sependapat melihat ada kesulitan karena Bang Berry ini 120 tahun kita di Indonesia itu nggak pernah membedakan ini wanita dan pria bahkan data internal kami itu 40 persen peminjam kami ya yang meminjam di BRI untuk bisnis SME dan micro bisnis micro banking bisnis itu udah 40 persen bahkan cenderung meningkat terus gitu ya. Jadi kalau dibilang eh, melihat ini kesulitan akses, saya rasa tidak. Dan untuk terkait paper-paper eh, work yang dibutuhkan, kelihatan sulit. Sebenarnya nggak sulit ya, karena paper worknya itu hanya memastikan memang calon peminjam ini layak untuk diberikan pinjaman. Karena ada dua hal yang kita hadapi dalam memberikan pinjaman. Layak diberi pinjaman itu tentu tidak sama dengan bisa diberi pinjaman. Semua orang bisa diberi pinjaman, tapi tidak semua orang layak diberi pinjaman. Itu kurang lebih yang saya mau tanggapi, karena kalau kita lihat dari isu gender eh, yang diangkat dari apa namanya dari penelitian ini ya ini tidak terjadi di tempat kami dan kami justru terus berupaya untuk meningkatkan penetrasi penetrasi terkait digital kami sudah melakukan beberapa langkah terobosan untuk digital banking kita baik dari sisi transaksi transaksi dan dari sisi pinjaman yang tentu akan mempercepat bahkan kami untuk uh, micro banking aja micro banking loan gitu ya kita proses dalam waktu satu hari sudah bisa kita pastikan dia tersalur pinjamannya sesuai kebutuhan dengan paperwork yang apa namanya sederhana sangat simpel terima kasih Thank you for that comment, and uh, I appreciate hearing your uh, perspective um, from the, the bank directly um, in one of these provinces. So that's, uh, I think, very helpful and interesting. Um, you know, our survey is is a reflection of what uh, uh, you know of people's opinions as they're giving them. So I think it's based on both experience, both on hearing from others, on you know what they're. Um, their overall experience has been over, over a long period of time. Um, uh, well, I'm very happy to hear that uh, your bank has been, 
you know, focusing a lot on making sure that a lot of different type of people are eligible to receive um, these types of credit products. I'm not sure that that, that, that does happen everywhere, that that is exper women's experiences um, in other, you know, in other banks or in other, other places. So I think, um, you know, even learning from you about what's working um, that can be transferred to other uh, financial institutions would be really helpful. And I think recognizing that, you know, different types of businesses in different sectors in different uh, locations might have different experiences as well. Uh, sorry, was someone else uh, had, a, had a comment? Oh, dari saya, uh, introduce uh, my host Ariansa, Executive Please, Director yes. of Fintech Lending. Yes, uh, thank you. I think uh, this research, this survey is, we get a very insightful information related to the, how the woman uh, get access to credit in Indonesia in, uh, in some of province. Uh, I am here uh, represent of industry of uh, Indonesia fintech lending. Uh, uh, this industry established in uh, already five years. Now we have 100, uh, 125 uh, provider, fintech provider, fintech platform that uh, we separate. Yeah, we have three uh, cluster of uh, fintech lending first in the productive loan and the second uh, multi-purpose loan and then and then Sariah uh, finance of uh, yeah from your survey I think uh, and also uh, happy to hear of uh, colleagues from uh, BRI Manado yeah Kantor Regional Manado that I think uh, different with uh, bank fintech lending yeah fintech lending industry mostly uh, we target we have a target uh, market for unbankable and underserved uh, people most of our uh, customer is from this segment and this is very different with the segment uh, from the uh, BRI or uh, uh, from the bank which is most of the bank customer is a customer that already have access to bank and the characteristic of the our our, our borrower is uh, we no need a collateral uh, to provide a loan to the to the to the borrower uh, related to the survey for the woman from our side uh, in industry we already disbursed more than 200 trillion rupees to a segment of unbankable and underserved uh, people and from our uh, from our data we have a fintech data center and from our data we have that uh, 50 percent of our borrower is a uh, woman yeah this is uh 50 50 women and men yeah uh 50 50 percent and uh we have one uh, platform yeah, amarta that uh that their user only women, only for women. They they, they provide a, a lending approach like Grameen Bank. That's uh, uh, with they provide a loan to the woman through a group of uh, borrower. Yeah, maybe ten to fifteen borrower. And this platform Amarta already have six hundred thousand user. Yeah, and and most of them is women. Most of them are women. Uh, they see, I think uh, maybe uh, the data and the uh, the fact about the the lending to the segment of uh, unbanked and underserved in Indonesia, LD, uh, we are we are very happy if you can also uh, elaborate our our data, our industry data in your survey. Uh, so uh, I think. Yeah, I am agree with uh, my colleagues uh, from uh, BRA, BRI, from the fintech side. Yeah, actually, uh, agree with the from the result that the report of the result that most of the user in the uh, in the area of survey 
have no access to fintech. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I think difficult to access fintech. This is uh, this information actually is very very relevant with our data. Since fintech, yeah, fin onboarding use so the users should, uh, should use technology. This is the challenge that most of our user in fintech. 85% is uh, 85% from Java Island, from the from the uh, develop area, yeah. Only 15, yeah, less than 15% from outside of Java. That's the challenge. Why? Because uh, we still have a challenge to we, we cannot get the in information the appropriate uh, image uh, appropriate information related to the, the borrower from offset Java that's related the most of the entrepreneur of micro uh, micro business in outside of Java and this is also include in Java not integrated in the digital ecosystem so uh, from fintech side it's hard to ask uh, this is a challenge for us to to do a uh, assessment for the the micro business outside of Java. Uh, not see the the woman or woman, yeah. I think uh, from our data, woman, woman and uh, men and women 50-50 almost, yeah, almost similar. But uh, the challenge from the fintech side is not the woman or man, but the challenge is related to the how integrated how the user use the technology so we can uh, do a uh, assessment to the to the user i think uh, that's uh, yeah our comment to the research this is a very insightful research i think but uh, we are happy if uh, you need more information later related to the fintech lending we already exist here and we have uh, 60, 60 million users, and if we see the the, the productive and uh, multi-purpose, the portion of, of from the fintech side, uh, still uh, sixty-five percent in the multi-purpose and thirty-five percent in the productive or the micro or micro finance. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate um, all of the comments. Uh, we did speak with Amartha and they're an amazing organization and do a lot of really good work. Um, I do not believe that they are located in either of these two provinces. Um, so there, there might be one office that's in the process of opening, um, but they're, they're not uh, here where, where our surveys took place. Um, I do think it's uh, interesting that um, uh, you know, we we are very um, focused and concerned about. You know, as I as I mentioned, our survey sample is really focused on these growth oriented women owned businesses, and so uh, this is a segment. Uh, you know, their average years that they have been in business is is for twelve years. Uh, so they've been around for a long time. Many of them have grown since they started, and yet they are still saying that they're having some trouble with getting access to to credit, and they're not using. Uh, you know, the operational or growth oriented uh, types of features on their phones for business purposes. So, you know, I, I do think it's interesting to, to note that um, they, they are still having trouble um, and that um, there are still some, some challenges. So I think that while things are, you know, have greatly improved and there have been a lot of um, strides have been made, I think it's important to note that there is, uh, you know, still some room for, for growth. I think that there are um, a couple of hands that might be up, and then we want to make sure to move on to um, on to the next presentation as well. Uh, Dewey, do you want to go, go ahead? Yes, uh, thank you for, for a very insightful um, research and uh, data that you have uh, presented. I would uh, probably dive into the e-commerce um, behavior of the MSMEs uh, that are surveyed. And uh, I just want to have uh, a question of clarification whether the study allows insight and analysis on e-commerce as to the, the utilization of other digital tools, 
such as point of sales um, or financial management um, that women are using, because this analysis may perhaps set some lights on how uh, and what can be done to ease the burden of mobility for women to, uh, you know, is the paperwork, travel burdens and all that, because women also do some um, gender related uh, conventional tasks such as uh, unpaid care work and housework. Maybe uh, also uh, perhaps this is just uh, something to be considered, the interconnectedness of uh, the digital platform uh, to one another, whether e-commerce with the financial service providers or uh, e-commerce with uh, e-money and all that is the answer. Um, because uh, from the supply side, uh, while transforming uh, the behavior, knowledge, attitude, and literacy uh, among women own MSME uh, to switch to digital, uh, because it is not easy. In one of our studies, um, we also found out that uh, most women are using uh, the so-called digital intermediaries, the most uh, literate or the more literate uh, family members, uh, neighbors, to access uh, some of the digital uh, services or to um, onboard to e-commerce. So that's uh, my question of clarification of the possible analysis or insights and probably uh, you know some suggestion on how to move forward with, with the how to or how can uh, mobility burden be eased. Thank you. Great, that's a that's a really great question. Thank you for for asking it. Um, we'll continue to to look at the survey um, uh, and and continue to do analysis. But I think that question is a good segue then into um, into Russell's presentation, where he will actually talk about some of the research findings um, from other uh, programs that uh, that could very much apply here. So I think without further ado, we'll um, go into the next presentation. May I ask the questions? Um, could I ask you to leave a comment in the chat or just wait until the end of Russell's presentation and then we can okay, get to thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, Russell, whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to see so many uh, people here to discuss these um, exciting issues. And um, I'm also sad to not be able to be in Indonesia for this workshop. Uh, before COVID, I was visiting Indonesia four or five times a year for research on private sector development and access to finance. Uh, so uh, sad not to be there, but uh, great to join you on Zoom. Um, so for my talk, I just wanted to follow up um, Kate and Willie's presentation by um, just giving some ideas about different um, interventions that um, address some of the constraints that, um, that were highlighted um, in the survey. And again, I, I wanna emphasize, I think that our target group um, for this survey was, was particularly um, growth oriented um, MSMEs. So there's a lot of questions about, um, you know, access to finance more broadly for women, you know, accounts, microcredit, et cetera. Um, but we're really targeting this more um, growth oriented um, SME subgroup. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, uh, so I'll I'll just um, highlight the couple constraints that I want to focus on in this talk, um, and that'll take two directions: focusing on um, client screening, so how financial services providers or FSPs onboard clients, and then uh, I'll talk about alternative forms of collateral, and then uh, conclude, and then. I look forward to further discussion at the end. Okay, next please. Okay, so uh, next slide. So as far as constraints, um, many studies and reports from uh, many countries, including Indonesia, the ASEAN region and other um, emerging markets have highlighted um, three broad constraints in access to finance. So one is client screening, how financial institutions, uh, select clients, recruit clients, onboard clients. Um, another is collateral. And finally, another is financial capabilities. 
Um, so the surveys uh, suggest that client screening and collateral are more pressing concerns. So just to quickly uh, review some of the results that were discussed earlier, uh, the surveys found that in this, in this segment, in these you know, two provinces among more growth-oriented enterprises, uh, many women prefer informal credit to formal credit. They say that that's because it's easier and more proximate and more likely to provide the amount of loan funds that they think they need. Um, many respondents highlighted the hassle costs of accessing um, formal credit. Um, as far as collateral, uh, respondents report often needing collateral to borrow but uh, many times they don't have the land buildings or even movable collateral um, that uh, financial institutions ask them to provide. Um, and joint ownership of assets uh, leads to spousal approval requirements that can also be a constraint. Um, within this um, uh, segment, um, we felt that um, financial and digital capabilities were a less important constraint. Certainly it's still a constraint for, for some people, but um, we did find that um, among women running larger MSMEs, many of them seem to be digitally active, at least for their own personal use. 40% um, of our respondents uh, use a budget, 40% have used insurance, 75% have um, savings accounts. So it's not to say that there isn't work to be done there, but um, I, I won't focus on that constraint in my presentation. Okay, next please. So the first area the survey highlighted as a more pressing constraint um, to access for to credit for women-owned MSMEs is in client screening. So um, what I wanna do is just present um, some research on what's already been done. I know that there's a lot of innovation going on in Indonesia in regards to access to finance in the FinTech space in the banking space, um, et cetera. Um, and I just wanna kind of uh, encourage more conversation by prevent, presenting some additional evidence. So, um, so you know, we think that uh, there's evidence that the needs of women-owned MSMEs may be different in uh, areas like marketing, credit assessment, and the loan approval process. So I'll talk about a couple studies that provide some examples of testing uh, what works uh, to increase financial inclusion uh, for women and credit access for MSMEs. Next, please. Next, yeah. Um, so one area would be marketing. Um, so it may be that marketing messaging that attracts women-owned MSMEs may be slightly different. So for example, um, in a study on digital wallets, uh, a research team worked with an FSP in Pakistan to test out different marketing messages. They did this uh, with large samples of um, clients, so tens of thousands of clients. Um, they found that sending behaviorally informed and gender centric text messages um, uh, encouraged people to refer others um, uh, for access to the accounts, uh, that that increased uh, referrals, particularly by women, up to 34%. So this showed that you know, a, a large scale kind of testing program could help um, refine uh, marketing messages and lead to real changes in behavior. Um, and the, the, you know, the expansion of, of digital services in Indonesia offers exciting opportunities to test what works at relatively low cost. So um, A-B trials, which are basically simple tests using randomization to test between different interventions, can be done over large samples of users. Um, many leading internet companies, FSPs, fintechs, um, use A-B trials, and we think that's a promising way to, um, to refine things and continue to prove, improve access to finance. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, um, sorry, I think there's a delay. Are you seeing it now? Okay, no worries. Um, another direction is fa in facilitating credit access. Um, so our surveys highlighted that some women-owned um, MSMEs um, prefer informal credit uh, because they say it's more um, convenient. That's not to deny that there aren't 
um, fintechs or, or um, um, banks uh, like BRI that, um, that might have great uh, you know, credit approval processes, but at least some women-owned MSMEs are reporting these challenges. Um, so there's, there's evidence um, from recent studies that have shown that facilitating the credit access and paperwork uh, process can increase access to credit. Uh, a study by Campos et al. Um, uh, did an evaluation on providing information sessions to MSMEs on formalization and about how to access bank credit. Um, and they found that these sessions generated high business registration rates and the two um, information sessions together led to significant positive impacts um, for MSMEs on having a business bank account, their financial practices, uh, savings, and use of complementary financial products. Next slide, please. Um, and another study by Dalton 2018 um, tested a higher touch loan application process that provided more support to applicants like for filling forms. Um, and the study found that reducing what you would think are fairly small adoption barriers, um, such as this paperwork support, uh, reduced the time cost of opening accounts um, and led to an increase in, in adoption by 62% um, and extra access to credit. So those are just some ideas around um, um, around facilitating uh, the loan uptake process uh, client screening. Um, the second area I wanna highlight is on collateral. Um, it was highlighted in the, the surveys that this is a pressing constraint um, for uh, growth-oriented women SMEs. Um, yeah. So in many cases, as you know, we all know, that a requirement for obtaining a loan is putting up sufficient and suitable collateral. Um, in some cases, banks will only accept a narrow set of assets like land or buildings as collateral, um, and many smaller businesses, uh, you know, run by men and women, uh, lack formal land title. Um, due to important government reforms in, in Indonesia, Indonesia was quite fast relative to other peer markets to, uh, to make reforms so that movable collateral, movable collateral like vehicles and equipment um, could be accepted. Um, however, some women-owned MSMEs um, report lacking even physical movable collateral um, for the financial institutions that accept that. Um, so a further alternative is to assess credit based on data that verifies business activity. Um, examples would include accounts receivable or third-party sales and purchase data. Um, so next slide, please. I'm just going to talk about a case study from some research I did um, in another ASEAN country uh, that looks at um, sales data specifically. So the, the broad lending model involves a bank partnering with a third party that can provide reliable data on the, on the activity of small businesses. Okay, um, so this could be objective data on the sales or the purchases of MSMEs. Um, this is a form of value chain financing, uh, where in this case we rely on a third party that probably has a business relationship with the MSMEs and the bank partners with that third party that's in a value chain relationship with the MSMEs to access information. So it could, the, the third party could be a large supplier or a large buyer. So in my own recent uh, uh, study, um, I studied an intervention where a mobile money company partnered with a bank to carry out this kind of model. So the role of the mobile money company was to regularly share data on the monthly mobile money volumes processed by its agents. So those are basically mobile money sales. And the bank then offered loans to the agents using a very simple formula um, based on the prior mobile money volumes. Next, please. Um, the loan product was quite successful. So in the first 12 months after it was offered, it lent out 20,000 loans to about 8,000 mobile money agents. Um, most of the agents um, run their own MSME. They aren't just doing mobile money. And there was no restriction on how they used the money. So they could have used it to also benefit their small business or their household. Um, these were really, you know, SME loans. I mean, uh, 
The uh, maximum loan size was the equivalent of about 15,000 US dollars. So there was quite large loans to some MSMEs. Um, and yet the delinquency rate was quite, quite low, uh, below 1.5%. Um, one concern that the mobile money company had and many third parties might have is if we share this data and our agents get loans, will they, will they also do more business for our competitors? So in, in this country, uh, mobile money agents aren't exclusive, and so they could take the loan and, and process more mobile money for other mobile money companies too. Um, our research contributed to showing that the answer was no. Uh, in fact, the agents uh, cut back the mobile money processing that they did for other companies uh, uh, after getting the loans, uh, while they significantly increased mobile money activity with the primary company. Um, and this insight could only be generated from um, this kind of careful study. Next, please. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the benefits to the bank of this were lower cost. The bank was able to issue the loans without any in-person credit assessment. It also reduced the application burdens on the loan applicant. Um, it allowed the very likely allowed the bank to reach new customers that, uh, you know, clients were able to be offered the loans that were far away from their branches or the contact networks of their credit agents. Um, and it was likely there was also broader socioeconomic benefits, so potentially less discrimination in the loan approval process. 50% um, of the borrowers um, were women. The credit scoring was based purely on their uh, mobile money um, performance. So there's no subjectivity uh, in the loan approval process. And we found other impacts of the loans. Uh, for example, it increased formal savings and empowered borrowers. Next, please. So, you know, there's a lot of opportunities. Some have already been discussed on this call to adapt and expand similar ideas in Indonesia. Um, factoring is on the rise in Indonesia, though an ILO report in 2019 highlighted that more could be done. Um, more could be done potentially to identify the movable collateral held by women MSMEs under emerging business models and to adapt credit design to those available forms of collateral. And then, you know, there's many opportunities to, to seek alternative forms of data, especially in the digital space on purchases and sales by women MSMEs, um, for example, on online platforms like e-commerce. So, uh, you know, you could uh, use sales data for women who sell on e-commerce platforms or um, input um, purchase data. Okay, next slide, please. So just to conclude, I can just skip to the last slide. Um, uh, Women-owned MSMEs may have um, different needs in some cases in the credit um, process than other MSMEs. Um, meanwhile, new technologies like digital finance and e-commerce are uh, raising new opportunities to reach, assess, and lend to clients. And we know that uh, many activities are already ongoing in Indonesia to promote these kinds of um, uh, avenues, and we want to continue to encourage that. And I hope I could share some useful evidence from other markets that actually um, provides kind of rigorous um, support for the effectiveness of some of these um, directions. So we think that these developments raise new opportunities to increase access to finance uh, for women-owned MSMEs, and we hope we can continue to encourage kind of pushing that margin forward, especially in the, the provinces that um, we're particularly interested in. And I also wanna just highlight that I think that approaches um, like AB trials can provide uh, a useful tool to quickly discover what works and then scale um, effective interventions. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to further discussion. Thanks, Russell. Um, so there's a couple of questions in the chat and since you ended on A-B testing, I'll ask this one first, but, um, and, and this can be for you or for Kate or for Willie. Um, 
So there's a question about how women might be aware of different fintech or P2P lending products that they can use, but they might not use it because of some kind of barrier, some kind of um, adoption issue, or maybe they're just technologically illiterate. Um, is, is that the case that you, you've been finding that people are, are aware of these products, but there, there is something that preventing them from getting it, or, or is there something else happening? Maybe that's best for Kate or Willie to address with regards to the survey. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm muted. Um, I, I think in regards to, to particular um, challenges, I'm, I'm trying to just review the question again to make sure that I, I fully understood it. Um, I, I do think that there are um, that there are different challenges. I, I mean. We keep reiterating the, the point that women are using their phones, they're using features on their phones, they're using mobile money and other types of financial products and services on their phones for personal reasons. So, um, you know, this is, <clears throat> this is work that, um, uh, this is, these are types of features that are familiar to them. This is, you know, things that they've done on their own. So I think if A-B testing is, um, you know, is going to be, uh, broadened or you know used in a different way. I do think focusing on messages that are directly towards um, a specific digital use case for women for their businesses, both from an operational and a and for a growth oriented business perspective. I do think that is important. Um, I think um, the work that Russell was talking about in in Pakistan. You know, we saw that um, from a lot of those SMS messages that were sent out that were uh, social norm messages that were actually women centric, you know, it didn't actually affect or change the way that men responded to those messages, which I think is really important, but it really increased the uptake and usage of, um, uh, of women's transactions on those accounts. So I do think um, A-B testing can be, you know, very powerful, um, even if it's in the short term. Um, it's something that can be easily tested and, and you can um, at a very friendly budget, um, uh, be able to, you know, to test out a lot of different messages and see where, if you start small, where that can that can take you next. Um, I'm not sure that I adequately asked the, the question, answered the question though, I'm sorry. Is there another piece to that? Um, if um, I, Ricky answer, um, asked the question, so if you have a follow-up to that, please let me know. Um, but otherwise, there's another question in the chat asking about, how there's several institutions that don't require collateral, like microfinance institutions. So why can't women in the semi get, get get loans from from these institutions? Okay, I'm glad to take that question. Um, yeah, I think that's an important question. Um, and yes, we're aware that there are um, uh, financial institutions that provide small loans. Um, and micro loans uh, without collateral. Um, and I, I'm well aware of the Islamic banking and Islamic finance sector in Indonesia. I've spent a lot of time um, talking to Islamic financial institutions and would love to do research uh, in that area. But um, I think what we want to highlight in our survey is, uh, you know, what we found is that um, uh, women MSMEs all often uh, report not getting enough financing um, when they apply to uh, for for, you know to uh, formal financial institutions, so it might be that they're aware that they can get collateral free um, financing, maybe two hundred dollars, you know, five hundred U.S. dollars, et cetera. But um, once we're kind of going above that, which might be what you know growth oriented MSMEs need, um, they're finding that it's a lot harder to access financing um, without collateral um, under more traditional uh, lending models. So I think I think that's kind of the distinction I would make between um, you know lending to micro enterprises and leading lending to more growth oriented um, uh, SMEs. But thank you for the uh, question. It's an important one. Thank you. And I think Tio has a question from Aftech. Hi, Kate. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. Thank you also. Uh, uh, thank you also for the uh, survey and the research done. I think it's a great, uh, <coughs> great uh, thing that uh, we are all discussing today here. Uh, my quick question is that uh, what is the, what is from your perspectives, uh, from IPA perspective, the 
the role of financial education and financial literacy for women SMEs to get finding, uh, funding. So because I think uh, we haven't really discussed it yet because I think the, there is still a really large gap in, in financial literate uh, women enterprises, but I would like to hear your thoughts on, on the survey that you did, that you conduct on uh, the level of an expert, because this is not a really underbanked woman or, or really a low literate woman, because there are women uh, SMEs. I would like to hear your perspective from your study, if there's any findings in regards of how well does a financial uh, education or uh, literacy levels of these women enterprises and how, how this affects in getting funding for their businesses? Quick and short. Thank you. Uh, sure. So we, what we do know is that they are um, financially active. So uh, women, uh, the women-owned businesses that were in our survey, <clears throat> are using uh, different types of financial products. So um, forty-five percent were using insurance. So I think we have, and then we've got bank account usage, savings account usage, um, a lot of borrowing, um, some um, a little bit of, of mobile money behavior. So I feel like our the sample that we um, uh, the the women that were in this particular sample were probably uh, a bit more sophisticated um, and had a bit more financial knowledge than than perhaps others. Um, so we you know, understand more about their, their usage and about what they've, uh, you know, their, their very recent uh, past behavior and that they're these growth oriented businesses that have been in business now for, for quite some time and have been, uh, you know, by definition successful at that. Uh, so, you know, I think our focus on, on these growth oriented businesses shows that there's, there's some correlation between financial activity and being able to use um, different types of accounts and different types of, um, you know, financial, uh, having a lot of different types of financial behavior for successful uh, businesses. Um, and I think, uh, you know, what we um, do see is, is not just the uh, financial usage and behavior and then, uh, you know, this we also see a lot of, of digital usage in general um, in terms of, of the way that women are using their phones, um, especially the high rate of, of smartphone ownership. Um, so we do see that that's translating into, uh, you know, different types of uh, like a, a lot of different um, uh, types of, of financial behavior that's happening. Uh, and I think that that's, that is important to note that our, our survey is probably more um, sophisticated and with higher levels of, of digital and financial literacy than perhaps other surveys um, or other, other firm, other, you know, data sets that are out there. Um, and so I, I think that's important to note. And I think what, you know, one of the things that I found so interesting about this particular data set is, is given that we probably have these higher rates of, of literacy and understanding and sophistication, you know, we're still seeing a lot of these challenges come through. Um, uh, that women are still having uh, trouble, you know, accessing the type of credit that really meets those business needs. So uh, to Russell's point a few moments ago, women were able to, to access credit, but not always at the amount that they that they sought for that that specific business opportunity or need. Um, so we, we can do a little bit more analysis, I think, on our on the survey and understanding a bit of, of those distinctions or differences uh, between the, the different types of users um, in terms of financial behavior. Um, so I, I think that's a that's a good question to think about. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, no, I would just add, quickly add with that that why why I think that this e-commerce channel is particularly uh, interesting because it provides a great way to screen the MSMEs that are already more digitally sophisticated. So. Uh, rather than just going and kind of going out into the community and trying to find who's digitally sophisticated, um, trying to you know access customers through through those kinds of platforms, I think it provides a, a screening device and a potentially a credit scoring uh, device. Thanks, Russell. So we're already a little bit over time, and so maybe I'll take one more question.
Okay, if there are no more questions, that's okay. We can um, start closing out. I encourage you to stay in touch. Um, we'll be sending out an email in the following week um, with the presentations, with some contact information and a recording of this presentation. So if anything occurs to you then I encourage you to um, definitely send us a message. Um, but now I'll, I'll pass it along to Rebecca Rouse, um, our Director of Financial Inclusion at IPA to give some closing remarks. Great, right. thank you, Tanvi, and thank you everyone for joining us today um, for this uh, presentation and discussion. Um, I think, you know, the, I think the discussion has been quite interesting in thinking about um, responsive financial institutions and other partners to the data that we've shown here. Um, you know, it's clear that in Indonesia, there's so much great work that's happening um, and innovative products that are on the market, especially in the fintech space um, that hold a lot of promise for women. I think the striking thing is, you know, in this discussion uh, we were just having with, with Russell and, and, and Kate, um, you know, our survey is showing a clear need for additional financing for these businesses. And, and, and just to keep in mind the, the target of the survey or the, the businesses that we were really looking to focus on for the survey are high growth potential businesses in two specific areas in North Sulawesi and South Sumatra. Um, you know, as somebody said, you know, places where there really hasn't been as much penetration yet of uh, some of these innovative fintech products and a lot of the types of you know, financial services that might be available in different areas, like in Jakarta, for example. So I, I think our challenge is going to be how to bridge that gap um, and, and create opportunities for these growth-oriented women-owned businesses in these areas to access that financing that they need to take their business to the next level um, and, and, and do so in a safe and profitable way, you know, for our, our, our business partners. Um, so, you know, while there is so much innovation and so much great work being done, we can see from the survey uh, results that they're really is more opportunity there. And it's something that, that, that our financial institution partners should be really excited about capitalizing on. Um, uh, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity there with obviously you know, great potential results for the women themselves and their families uh, and their ability to increase their incomes. But I think, you know, quite frankly, very profitable business opportunities for the financial institutions that are able to serve them. And we don't need to be thinking about women um, and women entrepreneurs just as solely targets for microfinance um, and, and those types of maybe nonprofit lenders. Um, you know, there's there's more there's wider opportunity here, and we see that there there is business potential and ambition um, among this the segment. So, you know, I think it's really great uh, great conversation that we're having now, and I I hope that 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 these you know this data that we've shared is um, you know is something that that our partners can take away and think about um, think about how they might respond and how they might you know uh, make make choices or act in response to this data and this information to um, you know, start to better serve these target markets. Um, on that, you know, IPA will be working with our partners, um, MCC and CDT, uh, Bob and S and o OJK to work with financial institutions one-on-one -on -one to um, you know, better interpret this data and help them to find ways to create innovative products and approaches for these segments and these provinces specifically. So if this is something that your institution might be interested in doing, please do reach out to one of us uh, from IPA who's on, on the meeting and we'll be sending around our, um, our contact information. Um, as a second phase of this project, we are looking for financial institutions uh, to partner with on, on additional more in-depth trainings on how to actually you know, leverage this data uh, for product innovation. So I do look forward to hearing from, from you and um, I hope there will be some interest in participating in this component. Um, again, I think there's a lot of opportunity here and we'd love to work with you on that. So just to close, um, I wanna thank everyone again for participating and for, for being here this morning. Um, you know, special thanks to Mr. Dading Ahmad Ganadi from Bapanas, um, the representatives from the Ministry of Cooperatives cooperatives and MSMEs and also the Ministry of Women Empowerment who are joining us today. Um, and then finally to IPA's partners, uh, especially Nilifer Ahmed from MCC, Widio Gunadi from OJK, Kurniawan Ariad from Bapanas, and Rini from CDT. And of course, Dr. Russell Toth joining us from the University of Sydney, Australia to provide comments from uh, academic uh, research.
So again, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you about further engagement. And as Tom B mentioned, we will be sending around materials in the coming days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.